All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Will Smith. Sorry if you were expecting somebody else. Um, I think I'll start by rapping about progressive web apps. Um, not really. Uh, so I'm a software engineer at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, which is uh, over by UW. And um, we just got back to work on Monday, which is pretty cool. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to keep working on that. Um, so about, I, this is my second Angular meetup. Um, I'm pretty new to Angular. And uh, like Mike said so eloquently that uh, I agreed to make this talk. I knew a little bit about progressive web apps and I've learned a lot over the past uh, couple of months or so. And uh, so hopefully I can share some of the stuff that I learned uh, while I was learning about them and how they work in Angular specifically. Um, so at the Fisheries Science Center, we have some unique uh, requirements. Um, there's a bunch of legacy apps. Uh, there's at least one that requires Internet Explorer running in compatibility mode. Um, there's, uh, we have um, some touchscreen clients. Um, we have one that's written in Python. Uh, PyQt for the UI. Uh, it looks like it was written 10 years ago, probably, because the UI is uh, a little outdated. Um, a lot of stuff, and we had like 10 projects coming down the line and a very small team. And so we had that brief opportunity to kind of evaluate um, web technologies and uh, the, the best possible platform that we could use to, to go ahead to, to capture most of our requirements. Um, a big thing uh, with NOAA is that uh, our software needs to be offline capable. So um, whether explicitly offline, like you're out at sea, or on some of the boats we have uh, satellite internet, that doesn't really work. Like you're connected, uh, but you have no internet or it's super slow. So um, that was a big, big requirement for us. Uh, we wanted to be able to use technologies that aren't super obscure, so we could hire on new people and they'd able to be able to use it. So we narrowed it down to React and Angular and Vue and other JavaScript frameworks. And uh, we ended up on Angular pretty quickly. We like TypeScript a lot and some of the other stuff about it. Um, so twice a year, we I go down with my boss to Newport, Oregon, and we get on boats and we plug in USB sticks to ancient laptops. And we do a bunch of software updates. And it takes a couple days. Um, so in an ideal world, we're imagining software that we can just update in the easiest possible way. Um, we have a bunch of databases at work that, uh, some Oracle databases that um, have an ancient system that we need to synchronize uh, laptops that are usually offline with. Uh, it's a big system that doesn't work very well. Um, so we wanted to, uh, to do that. I'm not going to talk about it specifically. We ended up using PouchDB and CouchDB um, as, our, as our database for synchronization. It's an awesome, awesome way to do it if you're looking for something like that. Um, like I mentioned, our PyQt library looks pretty ancient. So we wanted something that looked like it was written at least uh, fairly recently. And none of us are very good designers. So like the more help we could get out of the box, the better. And um, we wanted strong community support. Um, you know, being able to find people that, that know Angular. Um, and uh, you know, I, I came to the Angular meetup. I'm like, I felt welcome. I'm like, wow, this is a pretty awesome community. I made the right choice. So, and here I am giving a speech on PWAs. Um, so, uh, when we were looking for stuff, we I found this ancient progressive web app video from Google. I don't know if it was the very first one, but it was pretty early. And um, uh, Alex Russell and Francis Behrman kind of coined this progressive web apps term. And the uh, progressive part is, um, comes from progressive enhancement, which is a, a design idea where you start with your core web technologies and then you query the browser for enhancements that you can make, like the service worker, for example. Um, um, I'll talk about that in a second. But um, instead of the uh, the degradation based, like kind of fallback methodology. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that's in a progressive web app. I don't necessarily have to have them all to make it a progressive web app. So this is kind of this idea. Um, so responsive design, so we can write the same app that'll work on a, a desktop or a, a laptop or um, a tablet or a phone. Uh, connectivity independent, that's super important to us. That's the offline. 
Uh, the way this works in a PWA is a thing called the service worker, which is kind of the heart of the whole progressive web app idea. We'll talk a lot about that. Uh, it's supposed to be app-like, so it acts and behaves like a web app or a, a real application, a desktop app where you're clicking and you're not waiting for stuff to load. Uh, and it acts very responsive and looks like an app. Fresh. Um, so the way this works is the service worker is able to auto-update itself pretty quickly. Uh, so you don't have to worry about users downloading a new version of your app every time you put out a, a point release. Safe. Um, so one requirement for a progressive web app is that it's served over a secure context. So TLS, HTTPS. Um, it also supports uh, a local host. So as you're doing your development, you don't have to run a HTTPS server on your local host with a bogus certificate. Um, discoverable. So part of the progressive web app is a manifest JSON file that has a description of your app and some information that is will be crawlable by uh, Google and other search engines uh, so people can search for it online. Re-engageable. Um, that specifically, I think, was talking about a push notification. So I close out the tab of my progressive web app, um, and then I get a notification, hey, you have new email, or hey, you're awesome, or whatever. Um, installable. Uh, so we're browsing the web using an application. I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. Um, you know, Right now, some people say, hey, download our app at the App Store, and you go to the App Store and download it. Progressive web app, you're in your browser, and it says, hey, do you want this on your home screen? Click yes, it installs it to your desktop, uh, and then you just have an icon you can click. And we will show that too. And linkable, um, you can just send people the URL to it. Uh, you don't have to describe where to find it on the App Store. So, um, oh, let me talk. So here's the, like kind of the opposite. So the ancient Hotmail screen where they're calling it like in dash box, and um, I don't know if you are old enough to even remember this, but you click on like a email and you wait and you're like, okay, I hope it's loading. And then like, oh, no internet. It's basically PWA is kind of the opposite of that, right? So uh, it's also served off benqt.org. I don't even know what that is. Uh, and uh, this is what Google Photos look like. These are my glorious chickens. Um, you know, it, it works like an app. Like I, I'm like, whoa, this is a PWA. It's it's secretly a Chrome browser. There's these minimal set of controls up here. Um, it's pretty awesome. So, so like I mentioned, at the heart of a progressive web app is this thing called the service worker. Um, so I don't know if you've done what I've done a million times, where I have an Angular project open in front of me, and I things are looking good. I'm clicking around, and I'm like noticing some errors in the console. I'm like, huh, it's kind of working. And then I realize I, I closed down the ng serve process, and it's not actually being served. The service worker kind of fills in that gap. So it's super confusing when you have your ng serve closed because you're it can be completely run offline, completely from the browser with no internet at all. Um, it's just some JavaScript code. Um, the Angular team has provided us with uh, an awesome service worker, which is really easy to configure. Like I said, it's served only securely. Uh, this is what allows us to do offline support. And the way it does that is it sits uh, as a network level proxy. So any HTTP requests, it intercepts and can return stuff from the cache storage instead um, smartly. This is not an easy problem to actually implement. So this is where the, the Angular service worker really shines. It allows you to do push notifications. Um, Angular gives it to us through um, this Angular service worker and the schematic. If you just install the service worker, uh, you don't get everything you need for the PWA to work out of the box. So we won't do that. So yeah, to um, enable a service worker on your app, you do that. And you'll be off and running. Um, also, the, the service worker only works in your production build. So, um, so the service worker lifecycle is really confusing when you get started. Uh, sometimes you're, it'll be look like you're serving an old version of your application and stuff. Um, so as you get into it, you'll get used to it. Um, but the, the purpose of this um, is to, uh, it's all handled by the, the Chrome browser or the, whatever browser you're using. Um, it allows um, 
your tabs all to be running the same version of your software. Um, without Service Worker, you can actually have you know three tabs open, three different versions of your software, and if they're all accessing local storage in different ways, you can get into problems. So the Service Worker really helps um, keep your your software consistent. And um, so um, one question is, well, which browsers support progressive web apps? Um, when we first started looking at them, it wasn't a lot, um, but I will show you briefly the answer to that, which is yes. Um, so uh, this shows what browsers are supported. Generally, all the major browsers support it at this point. At this point. Um, another cool thing to look at is um, the HTML5 APIs. So we mentioned that your PWA should be app-like. So um, the HTML5 API allows you to access your camera. Uh, you can do Bluetooth and USB for IoT type stuff or um, programming an Arduino, um, geolocation, all that stuff. So there's a lot of stuff you can do in a PWA that uh, makes your life a lot easier. So I'll do the first demo, which is um, just uh, very bare bones. And so um, is that bigger? Yeah. Okay, so uh, so I'm not going to actually do any NPM installs or anything, so we, I can get out of here here in time, but. Um, so basically, I did ng new hello world, and then I did ng add at Angular PWA, and I'll talk about specifically what this schematic does in a second. Um, and then I added this PWA enabled text to the component. When you're doing, um, and then I did ng build production, which drops the uh, app right in the dist folder here. So. Um, what I've been using for uh, development is this HTTP, node HTTP server, disabled caching, make your life easier. And I'm actually going to open this in a guest tab, so don't make things go too crazy. So as you're developing PWAs, it's useful to use uh, incognito or the guest mode. <laughs> and so, um, you know, this looks just like the the boilerplate Angular thing here. So a couple of things. So when you're doing this, there's a, I don't know how well you can see that, but um, there's a hidden endpoint that's added by the service worker called ngsw slash state. And uh, things are going well. It says uh, driver state normal, so that looks good. Um, the coolest thing, that we get out of the box, so I can I can go offline, hit refresh, everything works. In fact, I can kill the server and refresh. Everything looks good. If um, in my development tab here, I go you go to the application tab and click on service workers, you can get an idea of what's going on here. Um, in development, you probably want to check update on reload. It makes your life easier. The service workers, when you make changes, will load. Uh, a single refresh instead of multiple refreshes. Uh, the other thing that it did is it stored a bunch of these um, things in cache storage. So it's able to, to serve them up. And uh, here's the favorites icon. This image is actually a data URL. It's not actually cached anywhere. Um, and so out of the box, you get you know pretty much basic functionality. You don't need to use the service worker to do your entire app offline. You can you could say, oh, I only want to you know use it for to improve performance on certain parts of my application. But um, so that's what you get out of the box, right? And what I'm going to talk about is how you configure it to to cache other things. So um, so that ng add Angular PWA. What did it do? It created um, a bunch of files. So there's the Angular Service Worker. NGSW config JSON file. Um, this is where we're going to configure our caching policies and assets that we're wanting to cache. The manifest.json, um, we'll generate one of these in a minute. Um, this is what the web crawlers 
look at and also what it's used when you install it to your desktop or your, your phone. Uh, a bunch of icons. Um, once you try to do that manually, it's a pain to generate, but I'll show you an easy way to, to generate all of those. Uh, it also updated some files. So if you install the Angular at Angular slash uh, service worker, only some of this stuff happens. Uh, the schematic is smart enough to, to do these updates that are required. Um, so it added these packages, uh, added a service worker Boolean, and some other stuff. Uh, so this is the configuration file. So there's basically just three things here, right? So the index here is, is um, what the service worker uses to uh, indicate that there's navigation happening. Um, in Angular, generally, it's always going to be this. The asset groups are uh, where you declare. Um, there's two included by default, but you declare uh, assets that your app that you want to have versioned and all bundled together as one app. So your app is served up in one cohesive versioned unit. And the data groups are for APIs. So if you have like a, a weather API or like a news API, um, then you configure those in the data groups where you can have a little more control over how they're cached, but they're not versioned along with your asset groups. So you have one or more asset groups. This is the interface for those. Um, we'll, I'll show you a real example in a minute. Um, you can name it whatever. So the installation mode, generally for assets, um, you want to do prefetch where your service worker will pull down all your icons and all your graphics and whatever the first time that the app loads. If you do lazy and you have multiple pages, um, then the user might only have half of the app cached, and then they go offline and they they didn't get every single image that they want. Um, the update mode is the same thing as install mode, except for when it only gets triggered when there's a new service worker installs itself. So you update your app, uh, and then it uses that update mode. And your resources can be files, um, like that favorite icon, our URLs, which I'm going to demonstrate for the material icons uh, and the material stuff that gets served up dynamically, but I want to keep hang on to it. Uh, the data groups, um, similar. Uh, it'll make more sense when I just demonstrate it, but basically you say, what's the API the URL? This is the glob format. Um, and I say, I want either the, the newest hit from the API, if I don't get a API hit within you know two seconds, uh, then serve up from the cache. Uh, the performance strategy will always serve from the cache until this max age is reached. Um, so uh, this is the, the Angular documentation is excellent on this. So uh, go here if you want to get more detail on that. The manifest JSON uh, that manifest is. Um, Pretty self-explanatory. Like I said, this is uh, how Google will, will find your app. And um, some of these things, like the theme colors and background colors, those are what are used when you install your app to your desktop. Um, and a bunch of icons as well. So, so here's the main demo, right? So I was trying to pick something that was had a little bit of everything to show. So I decided to do this kind of Pomodoro timer. If you don't know what that is, it's this kind of silly way to do your time management where you set a timer for 25 minutes, you do one thing and then try not to get distracted or interrupted, and then that's it. So I added pugs because I have one and they're awesome. Uh, and now main thing I want to show you a couple things. So um, when the service worker updates itself, it's nice to have the user be aware of that there's a new version of your app. So I'll show you how to do that through the service worker update. Um, I'll show you how to easily generate that manifest with a bunch of icons, thanks to uh, a Firebase tool. And I'll show you specifically how to cache assets that aren't automatically globbed by the default NGSW config. And I'll show you how to cache an API query in the data groups. And I'll show you how to handle push notifications. Um, so I'm not going to come back to the slides probably. So uh, I'll have these available on whatever link we send out after the meeting. Um, so there's some other links here. All right, so now for the moment of glory. So 
So I'll show you the app first, right? Let's see. Uh, Pagodoro. I've already built it. Um, turn off the cache. Go ahead and open this one. So uh, one thing about incognito windows is the desktop notifications are disabled by default. So I'm actually going to use a legitimate browser window here. Close some of these tabs. OK. So um, here's the app. And uh, it's nothing fancy. So you'll notice a few things. It's got material icons. That's what these icons are from. So this is a font. Um, has the material framework. Um, you basically um, earn pugs when you complete these things. My Microsoft Paint skills came in handy last night. I was drawing this. Clear them. Uh, and then the third tab um, this hits this uh, bacon ipsum generator uh, <laughs> API uh, that generates random meat-based <laughs> things. So no, that was kind of it's not serves no actual purpose, but other than for demo, um, added, so for your Pomodoro, you you know hit start and it counts down 25 minutes. When it's done, you get a pug. I have a five-second test mode. Um, and so you notice there was two things. So it was that giant plate of meat uh, image, and then there's, um, I just earned a strange pug. There's randomly generated dog names, and there's like six or seven icons. So our goal is to cache all these icons, um, cache that bacon and eggs image, cache the, uh, the icons here, and uh, figure out how we generated this manifest with the little pug image. There's one other thing you can do. Um, if it's served over HTTPS and you have a service worker, uh, Chrome allows you to install it. So I'll just click Install Pugadora. You have your pug dog icon. I hit Install, and it's suddenly in its own window, um, completely offline capable. Uh, and it shares the same local storage because it's stored in that same Chrome profile. So now you've seen the app. Let's actually, uh, I'll, I'll just jump right in here because this is open. Um, so this is uh, Firebase's app manifest generator. You can call your app whatever here. Uh, the long name is used on your device if there's enough space on the screen to show it. Short name. Um, is on limited screen space. The theme color is what you saw uh, on the title bar when I had it open up. So this is cool because you can choose your colors dynamically and actually get a view. Uh, display mode starts with full screen if the device uh, allows it. Otherwise, it falls back to standalone, which has a minimum, not the minimal, but a smaller number of controls. Minimal UI has forward and back controls. And then browser just opens a new browser. So generally, I think the default is standalone. Uh, you can specify the or orientation you want your app to function in, which is pretty cool. Um, I'll leave these the same. Um, so it says here, upload a 5 by 12 by 5 by 12 image, uh, 512 by 512. And if you don't adhere to that, then it will still give you an icon file. That doesn't work, so follow the instructions because it doesn't check for you. Uh, you just upload your image and then hit generate zip. And what that does is it gives you um, all these icons. That's my dog again. Uh, and it gives you uh, this manifest.json with your settings. And um, I, you have to modify the source a little bit, but that does all that work for you. So that's cool. So there's the manifest. That's easily enough. So now we have um, the colors and the installation icons prepared. The other thing we want to do is configure um, the service worker update module. So the way you do that, um, you import service worker update from the service worker module. Uh, I'm doing this in my app component at the highest level. Um, 
And so I declared a uh, service worker update uh, service here in my constructor. That's pretty standard. And I'm going to move this over. Um, you can do this two ways. You can do, uh, so I have an observable called up, uh, update available. That could just be a Boolean. And then I can uh, do an old fashioned subscribe for the service worker update available uh, dot subscribe. Um, I'm doing it this way because it's a little nicer. Um, but basically, I'm just mapping the uh, observable to a true or false if the update available message comes through. And um, if it's true, then in my app component HTML, I have a simple div here where um, it shows up if this update available is true. Sorry. Uh, and the user says, hey, update available, and they have a button that they can click on. They click on the button, and that performs this perform update. Basically, it activates the update and then refreshes the page. So um, it's nice for the user to be aware that there's new versions. This SW update API has some other things. You can continuously check for updates if you want to. By default, it just checks when you open the tab. Um, uh, and you know, the Angular service worker, pretty much everything's automatic. So this is unnecessary, but it's kind of a nice thing. All right, so that's what that looks like. The, um, so we wanted to cache the game art next. So I guess it's a game, it's a game like. Uh, so the, the rest of the stuff we're gonna do in the ng-sw config file here. All right, um, this is again. So what you get out of the box are two asset groups. Uh, this one handles your index HTML and your favorite icon. Uh, it's installed immediately when the, app, the service worker is loaded. The second one you get out of the box is this one where it will lazy load, lazy cache um, a bunch of these file types. Uh, images and WAF2 fonts and animations and whatnot. This is a pretty new uh, addition. So the service worker has been in Angular 5, uh, and um, I'm using Angular 7, and it's slowly evolved. So uh, I had issues with the previous versions of the software or the service worker. So I'm glad that the version 7 is finally seems to have everything working again. So I added this. So I'm, I'm in this asset groups, and I added this game art. This can be called whatever. Um, I said I want to install it immediately. And the globs for my pug images and my bacon image, which happens to be in that thing. So one thing I discovered um, this afternoon, actually, is if you have the order matters. So if I have my prefetch, prefetch assets these are lazy loaded, and the the glob is uh, more global than the one I have above here. If I have this above um, above this, then this gets ignored. I, I think it has to do with how the assets uh, says. Oh, it's you know everything from assets down. So I had to move this up above the lazy loaded. I don't know if that's a bug or if it's by design, but. Um, and, and while I was at it, um, we'll talk about this material fonts. So if you go to your index.html, so this is something I see all over the web that's wrong. Um, so people are talking about, oh, you know, I want to cache. So here's my font API, right? I want to cache this. Um, and then so they put this URL or something like it into their ng service worker. Problem with that is this is just the text file, and it doesn't actually include the binary font files. Um, so I was really confused why I would go offline and my, suddenly my material icons didn't work. Um, uh, so the solution to that is to actually browse to this, and you look inside the file, you'll find the um, where they're where they're loading the 
uh, legitimate binaries off of, which is this URL. So I just added that in the static fonts uh, prefetch and you can tell that they're actually stored because if I look in my cache here, application, you can actually browse the service worker is cached. And so here's my pugs. Uh, and it's pretty awesome. You can even see the, that the fonts are cached. So, um, so that covers the static, static thing. So um, at this point, I can go totally offline. Everything will work except for that bacon Ipsum generator. Um, and so all we need to do to make that work is first we have to know our API endpoint. So I'll jump over to my service, this API query service. Uh, this is what the API looks like. I uh, just copy and paste this much of it. Open the ng service worker configuration and add a data group. Um, call it whatever. Here's the API. Uh, the globbing for the data groups is a little bit different than it is for the assets. So I want to read the manual on that, but um, this should be good enough. And uh, I configured it so I will store up to two of these queries in the cache. Uh, I will delete them from the cache after a day. Uh, my strategy is freshness, so I'm going to hit the API. If I don't get a response within four seconds, then I'm going to fall back to the cache. Um, if I change this to performance, then I would immediately show what I have in the cache, um, and I would only query the API after a day. So uh, that handles it. So right now, if I go offline, refresh, this stays, this is pulled from the cache. And uh, you can see in my network here, that it's uh, all this stuff is being pulled from the service worker. So it's pretty awesome. It, once you know how to do uh, get the caching configured, specifically for the material, um, I've done it for Prime NG as well. And you basically follow the same process. You add it to your asset group. And, uh, and that is all I have, I think. So thank you. Yes, questions, please. I covered a lot of ground, so maybe you can watch the YouTube and play it back half speed or something. <laughs> uh, but uh, everything, I, yes. Is there Not yet. I have seen examples of that being done. Um, so I think that would work just fine. It, there's a lot of great. Um, Resources on the web people have done. Uh, oh, I forgot to show you how the service worker pushing works. That's one last thing. I'll do the five second demo of that. Uh, so you'll need to configure your back end. Oh, what did I do? I think you're no longer. Oh, well, never mind. I won't cover that. Uh, <laughs> it'll be in my slides. Um, the service worker push is. Uh, a little complicated anyway. So uh, if you look, I have a nice link on how you can configure that. Um, but it's pretty pretty straightforward. So uh, any other questions? Great. Thanks.